Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Simpkins. I'm the National Sales Manager for Valmont Structures Press Break Tubgirder Division. Um, thank you, Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance folks, for uh, hosting today. Um, so uh, I'll ask a question aloud. At the end of the day, um, we fabricate a steel bridge beam like all the other steel bridge beams. Um, but why why would you need to add something relatively new? This this uh, design of a press break tub girder is a relatively new design into the bridge community. Um, but this acts and operates like any other bridge beam. So why do we need to add yet another to the mix um, and maybe pollute the water some? Um, this is some data that we got from Michigan DOT, and what it's showing is that their concrete beam bridges and their particular inventory are not getting to the 75-year service life requirement that ASHO has built into their design standards. And Michigan is not alone in these findings. Most of the lower 48 states are seeing some similar version of this where their concrete beam bridges are just not getting to that 75-year service life. And ultimately, we're all kind of reaching for that 100-year FHWA goal. So here's our solution to that kind of chronic problem. And uh, again, this is a non-proprietary open source design that follows Ashto's design language per 611. It's a flexural box member. But you'll notice the uh, depth of structure is very similar to a concrete box beam or an I-beam or an e even a deep slab concrete bridge. And the steel industry uh, needed a product that had a very similar depth of structure to those uh, to cater to those short span steel bridges uh, or short span bridges from, say, 20 foot clear to about 100 foot clear. Um, but this design, it follows Ashto's design language. Um, it's non proprietary, it's open source. Um, so you are able to uh, get this from other vendors uh, as well as Valmont. Um, we are the premier um, supplier of, of this, but um, this is a very easy installation. Um, there are, are lots of soft benefits that I'll go through briefly, but um, again, open source and non proprietary. In fact, um, anyone with an AISC cert or uh, and uh, also uh, the uh, a press break can fabricate these. Um, ASTM allows an, a 2.25 T bend when we're bending uh, this base material, that base steel, but we actually follow Ashto's much more gradual bend directive of a 5 T bend. And we do that to ensure that we don't fracture that base material during the bending process. And that also allows for a category A base plate fatigue detail although we use a category B fatigue detail on our design standards just to be conservative. As I mentioned, uh, all you need to fabricate a press break tub girder is an AISC cert and a press break. Um, this really separates uh, the fabricators, uh, though this gives us some credence in the market to ensure that we are fabricating a reliable quality standardized product um, for those owners and for the uh, bridges that we cater to. Here's a good picture of that press break in action. Uh, the largest press break, uh, we believe we have the largest press break at 60 feet. It yields an individual piece of about 57 feet, but this is just to give you a good idea of the size of the press break versus the individual tub that it yields. I mentioned that this is an Ashto design, and in fact, Ashto chose the press break tub girder uh, back in 2021 as their innovative design award winner of 2021. And we continue to promote it uh, today. But what that means to you is that this design has been looked at fully by the bridge community, the Ashto community, and this is their official announcement, in their words, ready to implement technology, not only for um, any DOT, but for any owner out there. So municipalities, counties, uh, where this design was really kind of aimed towards for their short span. As I mentioned, uh, this is uh, non-proprietary and open source, and it follows Ashto's design language for 611, but it's really been the short span steel bridge alliance that had come up with um, components of this design. Um, but this was a term, uh, press break tub girder was a, a term coined by the short span steel bridge alliance, um, but you will be looking for a flexural box member in Ashto's design language. It hasn't come without a certain amount of work either. In fact, the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance has researched press break tub girders over the last 10 years, and they have a seven volume research report for you to draw upon uh, as representatives of owners. So they have all that data to back up some of the stuff that we'll talk about today. 
here's a good picture of a press brake tubger and kind of a testing phase, but this gives you a good idea of that 5T bend in that base steel. But your primary takeaway of my presentation today is the lack of need of inspection uh, for these tubs. Um, because there's nothing fatigue critical for an owner to inspect, um, now you can inspect them, but um, there's nothing fatigue critical for them, for your owner to inspect uh, once these are placed in service. Um, so the inspection criteria is a, a lot of uh, kind of, um, you're looking at any changes in the coating, whatever coating choice that uh, your owner has chosen, um, any deformation of that coating, but um, again, nothing fatigue critical to inspect once placed in service. When we talk about the first press brake tub girder that had been installed uh, in the states, uh, we believe this is the first one. Uh, this was done for the Monroe County Road Commission back in 2004. Um, these are fairly current pictures uh, back in 2017. Uh, these are the last ones, but um, you can see it's standing up quite well. Not that there would be any issue with a bridge that's only about 20 years old, but as a result of this first installation, Monroe County now has five in their inventory, including a uh, fifth that they inherited because of a bridge bumbling project that was let in Michigan uh, two years ago. Here's a good blowout of what a press brake tub girder looks like in all of its base components. Uh, you can see that the shear studs, we shop apply the shear studs, that's not a necessity, but uh, we do that to um, just speed up the uh, installation process. Um, they are um, mostly uh, galvanized by default, but there are some options in terms of coatings there. Um, there's also a good uh, picture of what a bolted splice connection looks like. For anything over 57 feet, uh, we personally have to uh, add a bolted splice to get to whatever that ultimate span length ends up being above 57 foot, um, but it's not a requirement uh, for fabrication. Here's a good example of what a base material of a press brake tub girder looks like. Uh, this is Ashto M270 grade 50 plate, and we uh, use a 3 8 plate thickness across all five sizes that Valmont fabricates. Um, now you can change. Uh, there's lots of variations in this design. Um, we also have a design for a uh, rail bridge that uses half inch steel, but um, you need to maintain the same bend radius um, to adhere to that uh, Ashton code. The tubs are cambered in a cold rolled process, and this is very exact compared to um, some other bridge beam designs. Um, with a concrete box, you have intentions to build in uh, the camber required for uh, both dead load and also vertical profile, but um, then you kind of get what you get. But with this cold roll process, um, it's constantly being monitored by the optical sensors that are on top of um, that uh, uh, cambering machine. So you're getting exactly uh, built in to accommodate dead load and also vertical profile within three eighths of an inch. Um, this also speeds up the fabrication process. Um, from cambering uh, in a number of days to a number of hours. Here's a good picture of uh, the stud welding machine that we employ, um, but this is really a value add to the contractor that doesn't want to do any field welding. Um, because we take this on in the shop, it's a much more controlled uh, environment, so it yields a much more consistent product. But we believe the most important step to this entire process is to take that black steel and galvanize the tubs. We galvanize to ASTM 123, so that's less than 2% rust that ever shows up on that coating um, over a 75-year period, even in a marine environment. Now, I think that owners are kind of trained that every 40 to 50 years, they have to replace a superstructure of some magnitude. Um, but because that coating will last 75 years, uh, let alone that steel underneath, owners are able to oftentimes leapfrog that 40 to 50 year window and get a significantly extended lifespan out of uh, the, the galvanized tub versus a uncoated tub. Now, if you are unfamiliar with galvanization or you don't feel that it fits in a certain environment, um, that's okay. Um, there are other coating options out there. There's a three point three paint coat system that you can employ. Um, you can also paint over uh, top of that galvanization and get a even uh, further extended lifespan um, out of that uh, particular one. This is not, uh, it, this is a galvanized steel bridge. Um, this was installed in 1966 in Upper Michigan. Um, and uh, because of that galvanization, uh, it is still standing today. Um, 
we recently went out and did a coating thickness test and found that on average, there's still 4.7 mil of galvanized material remaining on that steel. And even in low spots, there's still about 2.9 remaining. And if you try and forecast out the balance of service life uh, of this particular bridge, you can estimate there is an additional 50 years where um, uncoated steel or other designs in that same area that had been installed around that same time frame um, are not faring nearly as well. In fact, they've probably already been replaced. So a good testament to uh, considering galvanization um, on your steel product. If you wanted to design your own press brake tub girder, here is the roadmap in Ashto's design language to get from start to finish um, in terms of design. Um, but if you didn't want to go through that initial missionary work, um, you can choose some sizes. We chose some sizes uh, based on similar depth of structure uh, options like a concrete box beam or uh, a concrete I-beam. But um, this is what uh, a tub selection diagram that we publish um, for you to make a choice. Uh, for your tub size based on span length and spacing. Um, now we publish the most efficient solution, but oftentimes like with other competing um, bridge beams, um, you might be able to get away with using a more shallow tub, but then using more of them across the width of the bridge to achieve the same length and loading criteria. We do employ uh, a bolted splice connection for any uh, bridge beam span over about 57 foot. Um, that's when we, we put that bolted splice connection uh, on there to get to whatever that ultimate span length ends up being. Um, now, we typically leave it to the contractor to uh, put those nuts and bolts together. Um, the, we're always trying to keep uh, the tub girders at the lowest possible cost because most bridge projects are usually driven, driven by cost. Um, so we typically leave them in their individual components for freight uh, to keep them on a standard flatbed truck uh, so that you can ship uh, as many tubs as possible on that on that standard flatbed truck and keep that um, freight uh, dollar cost average low uh, for that project. This is also a category A base plate fatigue detail. So um, there's no other surface prep that needs to be done to the tubs or for that uh, um, bolted connection, uh, it's just a matter of putting those nuts and bolts together out in the field, which contractors know how to do pretty well. Um, also, everything is galvanized, all light materials. Here's a good picture of a press brake tub girder in service. Um, you can see that it's placed in service, and I get lots of questions about inspection, but honestly, once a tub girder is placed um, on the bearings and its driving surface is placed on top, um, the interior of the tubs really become an enclosed environment. Um, but we understand that owners like to inspect all of their bridging, not just the stuff that um, might be problematic. With that said, um, there are we put inspection ports on either side of each tub, and it's a 12-inch diameter hole where you can uh, get up uh, your head up inside and take a look and see all that pristine galvanization on the interior. Um, also, there are two two-inch weep holes on either side of each tub, too. Uh, so if any moisture has gotten in through that concrete deck, um, it will drain naturally towards the inspection port or the weep holes. Um, there are some variants of where we can put that inspection port as well. Um, so if you want it closer to the abutment or further to uh, the center of the tub, um, we can't put it right in the center, but uh, we have some variants a couple feet back or forth. Um, <coughs> we're also cambering the tubs ever so slightly by default. So if any moisture has gotten inside, the high spot of each tub is in the center. So any moisture will drain towards that inspection port or the weep holes. So once you understand uh, tub girders, your next question is, well, what are our choices for a driving surface? And really, um, you've got a few. Um, I think everything comes down to either time or money. Um, with that said, we are seeing contractors choose to do a cast in place deck more often than a precast deck. Um, and again, it's because of cost. Um, contractors make money casting concrete, and uh, we don't want to exclude them from this entire process. So um, about 80% of the time we're seeing a contractor choose to cast their deck in place as opposed to using a precast deck. Um, but again, as an owner, you have options. So what you're seeing below that rebar here on this picture is the two-inch stain place metal decking that goes over the top of the tubs, or like in this example, it's being used over the entirety of this um, deck. And then it's just a matter of uh, putting the rebar down, setting, um, forming the sides as you would with any other bridge beam, and then you can start that casting process with um, that, uh, that machine that they're using up there in Michigan. Uh, additionally, uh, 
as with other fabricators. So we can also add any hardware to those outer tubs to make this casting process faster. So any half hangers, any Nelson studs, um, any hardware that needs to go to those outer tubs where they can uh, speed up that casting process or do uh, the cast in place deck, um, we can add that prior to galvanizing and then that contractor doesn't have to weld on galv and they don't have to weld in the field. Again, uh, a time saving effort. With that said, if a precast deck is more attractive to your owner, um, you can choose uh, to do a precast deck. Uh, tubs typically uh, uh, support uh, about seven feet of concrete, uh, but we can get them as close as uh, about five feet, uh, and that's the, pretty much next to each other. But this is a good example of a precast deck where they use it for not only the deck, but also for uh, they precast that back wall as well. So you can precast as little or as much as uh, your owner would like. Um, now, instead of shipping the tubs to the replacement site, we would ship them to a local precaster where they would do that work out in their, their yard, and then the tubs would be shipped individually to that, uh, that uh, bridge replacement site. And then it's just a matter of doing a closure pour between those panels to make that driving surface cohesive. Here's another play on a precast deck, but this is a transverse deck. So many more of them across the length of the bridge to do the same job instead of those long longitudinal pours. Now, this is uh, kind of a, uh, an interesting design choice because now you as bridge designers are saying, wow, now all these joints have been created uh, on this bridge uh, where, on this bridge deck where um, these are, are potential points of failure. Um, where water can get into those joints and create a problem. Now, the owner recognized that uh, this is a job in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. Uh, the owner recognized that and put up the overlay over the entirety of this bridge to then try and shield those joints that they created because of particular design. You can see the holes in the shear studs. That's where um, the shear studs marry up to that deck. Um, and then it's just a simple grout that goes into each one of those holes to make that connection clean. I've got a couple of project summaries. The first is from Jeff Blue. He's the president of NACE, as uh, Dr. Barker uh, alluded to before. Um, but, hey, uh, Jeff, can you can you turn off your video? You're starting to break up a little bit. We want to hear no you clearly. No problem. So this is uh, some slides that we took from Jeff Blue, um, and uh, he did a presentation. He did a press break tub girder in his county a couple of years ago, um, but compared it to some of the stuff that he typically uses in his replacements. He's got a pretty large inventory of bridges uh, in his county, but um, he evaluated press brake tub girders along with um, some of the more common designs that he typically uses, that precast beam, uh, another hybrid bridge, um, a deep slab concrete bridge, and then the tub girder. And while the tub girder doesn't have the overall lowest cost, because we're expecting such a significantly extended lifespan out of that um, design compared to some of the others, um, he's expecting a much lower uh, dollar cost average because of that extended life. Additionally, he replaces about eight bridges a year, but he believes that he's going to be able to knock that number down to about four a year because they're all going to live a little bit longer. So a good endorsement from Jeff. Um, this is a project that we did up in uh, northern Michigan about a year and a half ago, but um, we typically design, uh, much like Gary talked about a little bit before, um, where it's a simple uh, for dead load and then a continuous deck for live load. Um, that's a very similar design to what we typically see, um, but we can account for um, multi-spans as well. We can accommodate skew. Uh, we can accommodate any... Um, uh, guardrail uh, requirement. So um, when using press brake tub girders, you're not stuck with one particular um, design choice if you tend, uh, if you would like to uh, use a press brake tub girder. Um, now, uh, these tubs are very torsionally rigid, and so there aren't any external diaphragms that uh, are needed um, below 70 foot span length. And so we start adding them at around 70, 75 feet. But um, these tubs are very torsionally rigid, meaning that you can work in the interior of these tubs without those external diaphragms and with only limited fall equipment. Um, so you can walk in those tubs and uh, set that stay in place metal deck. Um, that's, this is a good example of how the stay in place metal deck is installed. So they would install them between tubs and then they would work themselves out on either side 
um, and deck over the top of the tubs as well. Here is uh, the uh, diaphragm connection uh, between uh, spans uh, that I uh, was kind of showing you um, this two span. Uh, there is uh, some continuity connection between those spans, and that's uh, the detail that I typically showcase. But um, you can use any abutment type uh, with these tubs as well. Um, you can do um, a integral or semi-integral back wall um, or uh, uh, GRE, material stabilized earth, tensor baskets, um, whatever you and your owner is comfortable with and accommodates um, some of those uh, girder reactions you can use. So I think that every project comes down to either time or money, which one is really driving the project. Um, with that said, we are seeing uh, this precast element more often than not. Um, and, and I think there's some misconceptions out there in the world where if you want a fast bridge, some component of that is going to have to employ precast concrete. But a contractor that is good at doing their job, um, it goes almost as quickly as using precast elements. So um, all of the tubs, they arrived on a single truck um, for this entire bridge. And so they set them in, in, in just a single morning as opposed to having to control it logistically and have them show up one at a time. But um, because they set the tubs in a single morning, then they were able to form up the sides for that concrete deck. And um, then it's uh, get ready to pour. So uh, tubs arrived on a Thursday. By that following Thursday, they're ready to pour concrete. Um, and then it's just a matter of waiting for that seven day wet cure for um, until either the, the contractor can use that bridge and finalize things or potentially open it to traffic. So it moves almost as quickly as using precast elements. And here's the final bridge uh, there for you. We also had a project in California. Uh, this replaced a three span and we replaced it with a single span and still kept the weight significantly below um, what the original design was. It was a deep slab concrete bridge, but um, they, uh, installed it uh, here. Uh, those piers are from the old bridge, uh, but this is a clear span. Um, now, the original intention was to cast the deck in place, uh, but you know that uh, it doesn't always work out that way and utilities were in the way. So the contractor precast the deck on top of, or on top of the tubs in the field, and then they set them individually after those uh, utilities were moved. We also had an emergency project last year, and I think that um, steel gets a bad rap in terms of lead time, but um, the tub girders can be fabricated and delivered in anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks, but sometimes uh, the, the fire is bigger, the problem is bigger than that 10 to 12 weeks, and this example in Tennessee is, is uh, kind of highlights uh, our ability uh, to provide tubs faster than 10 to 12 weeks. Um, we had an agreement with Tennessee DOT, and in fact, uh, they are working on a design standard for press break tub, tub girders right now for themselves, along with Colorado and Texas. But this, uh, br these bridge beams were supplied in six weeks um, to the job site for this emergency replacement that Tennessee had uh, around uh, the 4th of July last year. Uh, tubs nest very efficiently on trucks and they're very light. They're, uh, even our largest tub is about 150 pounds of linear foot. So you can get up to six tubs on a single truck, keeping that freight cost to its lowest. Uh, additionally, you don't have to have a large crane to install these. Um, you can use smaller cranes. You can They can boom out further. You can set center spans instead of having to get into the water. Um, so you can use lighter equipment. In fact, uh, most of the contractors we see usually just use an excavator uh, to install these. So very light and easy to install. Um, abruptly, that's the end of my presentation, uh, but I've got time for some questions if anybody has any. 